Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I thought if we could, if we if we could start actually by uh, above of you all could just introduce yourselves to me. If you could tell me your name, your year in the program, and um, without it sounding like too much pressure, if you could tell me what your primary working medium is at the moment, um, that would really help because I I done a few of these and I feel like I'm just shouting into a computer screen. So I'd love to just hear back from you all first um, and then I'll show you uh, around the studio. Great. Um, Kat, why don't we start with you? Hi, Jonathan. Um, I'm Kat Davila. Um, I am a first year uh, MFA student um, in the discipline of sculpture. Uh, I mainly work with fibers, actually, um, and I, I do like wall art pieces with fiber and um, chicken wire. It's a weird little interesting textured mix of, of, of work, but I also work with steel as well and other items. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. Nice to meet you. Tiffany? Hi, uh, I'm Tiffany Nesbitt. I'm a second MFA student in sculpture, and I really enjoy working with ceramics and found objects and um, different ropes and different things interacting with each other and basically marrying the different materials together. Uh, I'm also really interested in large scale mixed media paintings, like what you see behind me. <laughs> uh, and then also collage work. I do a lot of collage work. Um, but yeah, it's great to be here and hear your work. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Nice to meet you, Tiffany. Megan? Hi, uh, my name is Megan Gonzalez. Um, I'm a photographer. I work primarily in film. Um, photography and I'm also a poet and I really appreciate you asking about us because I think that's really neat to what you did. So, <laughs> hello. Hi Megan. Looks like you have nice nice weather behind you also as we do yeah, in New York huh. today. It looks it looks really nice. We have the windows open. Um, it's, it is nice. It's good weather today. Good. Javier. Hello. Um, my name is Javier Rivera. I am a bachelor's in fine arts at the moment, and my main medium is painting. I like to paint in acrylics and oils, mostly like realistic stuff, not nothing too big. Nothing too big yet, Javier. Right. <laughs> Wait until every professor tells you to make it bigger, if they haven't already. <laughs> they are already, uh-oh. <laughs> I hit a nerve. Nice to meet you, Javier. Nice to meet you, too. Nadia, go ahead. Hey, Jonathan. I'm Nadia, and I am in the last semester of the art school and majoring on art history as well. And um, I enjoy painting most more than anything. And then I draw a lot of flowers, a lot of flowers. I'm obsessed with flowers. <laughs> What's your area of interest in art history, Nadia? Do you have a particular area? Baruch mm -hmm. is always my favorite. <laughs> cool. Mm -hmm. okay. Nice. Nice to meet you. Did you say my name? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Trisha Myers. Um, this is my last semester in the um, painting BFA program. And um, I mostly work now in, in oil paints. And yeah, they always, they always tell us to paint bigger. So that's what we're doing. Are you in a, in, is that your BFA studio, Tricia? Yes, yes it is. That it's, looks really big. It's really big. Um, they're really nice. These are the old grad studios. So we kind of upgraded. Wow. Yeah. Lucky all of you. Yeah, 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 definitely. I've visited a lot of closets over the years. So closet size studios, so nice. <laughs> Thanks. Bailey, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, I'm in my last semester. Um, I went through the uh, my BFA, I should say, and then um, I went through the painting program also, like Trisha. Um, yeah, I I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, I'm just painting. Really, I'm more interested, I guess, in like interior spaces. But um, yeah. Thanks. Nice to meet you, Billy. And Eric. Howdy. Um, I'm a third year junior level uh, industrial design student. Um, I really like working in wood, but I also have a lot of experience like, with like 3D printing and welding stuff. So a lot of physical, physical stuff. And are, is the industrial design sort of within the art department or is it's, it a, it's in the sort of its own school? It's, uh, okay. it's its own separate thing. Cool. Yeah, I don't know how Eric found us, but I'm so glad he did because more <laughs> industrial design students should be, we should be merging more. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Eric. And Marley, uh, Marley's actually not in this class, but I think she can handle being on the spot. Talk about it. Hi, that's my cat um, attacked my computer. Hello. Uh, thanks for letting me crash the session today, Jonathan. It's sure. nice to meet you. Um, I'm a third year grad student also in sculpture with Tiffany and Kat, um, and I work with a lot of fibers, domestic objects, and photography recently. Mm. Um, yeah, glad to be here. It's nice to meet you. What's What's your cat's name? This is Velma. Velma? Velma, yes, like the Scooby-Doo character. Oh, uh, that's a great cat name. <laughs> Thank you. She's perplexed by Zoom, and I just got home, so she's like, pay attention to me. Um, so she'll be joining us, if y'all don't Great. Mind. Nice. Nice to meet both of you. Thanks, you too. And Kariana? Hi, I'm Kariana. Um, I'm in the last year of the BFA painting program. I mostly do acrylic paints and collage work, but I'm learning oil paints. Yeah. Great. Great. Nice and to meet you. Paula? Yes. Hi, my name is Paula Braccio, and I'm a junior on the graphic design. I think I can't say that's my favorite thing. I like to work <laughs> with my hands too. <laughs> I mostly draw, I think, but I do like watercolor, oil paints. I think I, I like, I really enjoy do a lot of things. Hmm. Well, it's, I, I think you still have some time to decide. Right. Oh. I'm still learning about the graphic design thing. I like it, but I really like doing everything with my hands. Oh, nice. Well, the best gra graphic designers know how to use their hands and right. be tactile also. So nice to, meet you. nice to meet you. Jacinta, whenever you're ready. Sorry, I was just driving back. I just go home. Hello, my name is Jacinta. I am a, a sculpture grad and i'm working with it's a mess right now it's like i'm doing ceramics and i'm also working with fabrics and mirrors and like insulation and what you said about making everything bigger that's my concern right now <laughs> <laughs> but looking forward to to seeing your studio thanks nice to meet you Cinta. um it's texas so you have to make it bigger i suppose um so i thought what i would do uh, and it's thank you all for for um introducing yourselves to me i appreciate that um it's really interesting to hear the diversity of materials you're working on uh that's really exciting for me as someone who works in very diverse material practices uh even though i focus especially on the um, intersection of painting and performance or, or painting and body movement broadly speaking my degree my uh, graduate degree is actually in sculpture um, and my undergraduate degree was just in a sort of general art program BA in art and also in sociology um, I thought what I would do to start is something I like to do with visitors to my studio um, which is to just ask you to look at something for a couple minutes it's a little hard over zoom I've never tried this over zoom so um, You'll need to go into the screen mode where you're primarily focused on speaker mode just for that. Um, and so I thought I would 
move my computer around and show you a recent painting that I just finished. I'll give it like a minute and a sort of broad view. Then I'll bring my computer a little closer for another minute uh, or so, and then I'll turn it around. So if you could just sort of focus on looking at it, think about anything that comes to mind. Um, and I, I like to start there as a way to sort of start with looking. I practice a lot of sustained observation, both in my performance works and in my work with students. Um, see what questions come up from there, and then I'd be happy to uh, start showing you around the studio. So I'm gonna start with, this one is big, but I'm gonna start a little bit um, closer. So if you go in speaker view and just sort of study that, and then I'll move even closer after about a minute has passed. And do your best not to look at your other devices while you do that. I'm just going to turn it around so you can see the back. Okay, let me just hang this back up.
So I would be curious, um, anything you saw or discovered and looking at that closely and um, feel free anyone to, to speak up and then that'll sort of help me figure out what, uh, what I might show you in my studio. That's okay. So is this work it's it's all canvas is it all canvas and then it looks like you sewed together each individual piece separately and then quilted it together or almost quilted i guess i don't know the right terms but <laughs> yeah definitely interested in like the process of like if you like painted each individual piece separately and then sewed it together uh or if you like made it and then painted on top of it. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Did anyone have a, anyone get a sense of that just from looking? Uh, yeah, well, I, whenever I first saw it, I thought maybe it was canvas like, and then you taped off because the lines are so clean. But, mm. and then there were a few areas that looked like, like it, like one, you know, I don't know, shape kind of bled a little bit into the next shape, but just a little bit. So I don't know if that was just a coincidence or because I don't know, the more I looked, the more it looked like you did each separately and then like put them together. More than anything, I'm interested to see what is it? Is it a painting or is it a glass? I don't know, I can't, it's hard to tell. It's, it looks like a marble. I like colored marble from far back and then from the back it's like a painting so it's definitely tricky <laughs> um could anyone sort of see or get a sense of what the materials were that i use i don't know if it translates across zoom or not um some pattern because i kept trying to look for pattern i kept trying to look for you know and of course there's the the, the triangle pattern there and mm. you know kept seeing them come together but i was seeing like bits of uh like the seams you would see on denim um mm. i saw buttons like uh like this part of the shirt where you see button i, I was seeing so i was like trying to like find rhyme and reason in it and not just like abstract shape i was like is there faces in here that i'm not lips and mouths mm. but the mm. the thing that stood out most was like i'm like that's most definitely the seam of some denim that i'm seeing within the uh collage of uh things pieced together yeah so yeah you're absolutely right it's it's um it's not canvas actually but denim is actually very uh, similar to canvas and the way that it's woven. Um, and I had sort of noticed that about denim a few years ago and started collecting old jeans and denim from friends, family. Uh, the interesting thing about denim is they use two different colors of thread. So the darker thread typically shows up on the outside. And then if you turn a piece of denim over, you have that sort of beautiful other side, which is lighter. Um, and I also work a lot with uh, taking the sort of uh, natural, it's not natural because it's already dyed, but taking the denim as I find it and then dyeing it again. So some of what you're seeing is denim, which has been, you might call it over dyed or, or re dyed. Um, some of it is painted, some of it is stained, but it's also made from both denim and from shirts. So uh, typically I use like um, shirting material for like a for lack, uh, I guess the best way to describe it would be like a men's business shirt. Um, and I'm sort of interested in what that material conveys culturally, historically. Um, and that material I stain and soak and apply all different painting processes to it. But then I leave some of those seams and buttons and pockets to show up. And I, uh, if you looked on the back, so anyone get a sense of what's going on the back and why it's so different from the front? And I like to show these typically in installations so that you get to see both the back and front, by the way. I think that was the more confusing part because when I saw the front, I was like, oh, got it, it's a quilt. And then you turn it and I was like, why, why did he make it so complex? It seems like there is no extra work. <laughs> I ask myself that every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there is extra work to hide the front 
So, so there is something with the front and the back. Yeah. Um, well, that's both practical and impractical and overly complicated, but because I'm using material like uh, shirts, shirting, which is very thin, and I'm using t-shirt material quite often in other works, that material is too thin to sew together and to maintain its shape when I stretch it. It would become really sort of warped and wrinkled, and it wouldn't have this sort of crisp crispness that I'm going for in the work. So each piece of material, um, except for the denim, which is strong enough to sort of hold up on its own, is backed using this um, archival glue sheets, uh, is backed with linen. So um, I also started dyeing the linen because I wanted the back to have this sort of other quality to it. And I don't know if you could see in this particular piece, but some of the linen had almost like a flower pattern on it or something like that. Um, I collect a lot of old linens, um, having like good linens historically in the US and in many countries was sort of something that you kept and you only used for special occasions. But as the generation of people who had quote unquote good linens um, is dying off, a lot of those are just going to like flea markets and Salvation Armies and places like that. And uh, my mom and her friends, when they found out that I was using these for the backs of my paintings, started collecting them and sending them to me. So now I have bags and bags of old linens, which I often dye, and I use them to back the painting. Linen is the most um, archivally strong material. So that also gives a, an extra degree of sort of heft to fabric that I'm really manipulating and sort of um, bruising, staining, sewing, cutting to pieces. So I like that the linen also gives this sort of extra degree of um, archivalness to the work. Uh, and then I also like that you get to see it on the back and that you get to see the seams on the back of the painting. Uh, so that as a viewer, when you go to see one of my exhibitions, there's this quality of discovery and of sort of moving around the work differently than you normally would. And for me, that partially comes from um, having worked for many years in the studio with uh, dancers and performers, it's getting hot in here today, um, who were very physical in the studio with me in terms of how we made marks on different materials. I also like the viewer to have a certain physicality as they're exploring the work themselves so that they're sort of more in their body as a viewing audience than they normally would be. Um, and then just one more thing I'll note, and so you can see this is, this is a piece is about, oh, I think it's about five and a half feet by four and a half feet or so. What I like is that when you, the reason I stretch these and don't just sort of tack them up the way you would with, with for example, a quilt, which many people brought up comes to mind. Um, I like them to first read as painting, as abstraction, um, as a sort of, um, nice looking object, uh, artwork. Then as you get closer, I like for that read, that first read to become more complicated. So you start to see, oh, actually this is, is this a painting um, or is it marble something or other? Um, is, it, is it sewn together or is it painted in these really straight lines? Then you start to see those seams and buttons and you realize that actually, oh, it's not just a painting, it's not just this, this beautiful illusion or this surface that you just want to fall into, but it's actually the material, really the material of like everyday life, stuff that people wore, stuff that they had next to their bodies. And then once you see the back of it, it gives you yet another read. So I like that the front has this sort of um, marks, which are really uh, sometimes have, you know, uh, foreground and background effects and lots of depth and, uh, complexity and uh, real variation in shades and hues. So you have this idea of painting, but then you get to the back and you're like, oh, it's also just material. So that there's this flipping back and forth between the sort of presentation, the sort of performance of the painting as a painting, as a work of art, and the idea that, oh, this is, this is actually the stuff of everyday life. This is the stuff that's next to our bodies. Does that make sense? It does. And is that the the reason why you, um, the way you had your um, um, 
painting present in one of your uh i guess it was a gallery that you had you had the little um i don't know what they call it but it's you you uh, post i mean you you uh displayed your art somehow that people can walk around it so that's a reason yes. why they're just trying to trick okay that's interesting yeah and it and kind that, of reminds not... me Good. Uh, sorry it kind of reminds me Good. of like back in like 1980s it was some this graphic pictures that you would look into they would like make no sense but if you as you stare at it you keep like getting images out of it it kind of <laughs> reminded me of I remember that. those <laughs> What yeah, were I don't know what called? they called. <laughs> yes, yeah, so they was... had a funny name. You could buy like poster books of them. Exactly. Uh, um, yeah, you're, I, I don't intend for you to actually see anything like real or representational. Um, I'm really interested in abstraction and how we experience abstraction and how we experience um, representational art for many reasons that I could go into to more deeply. Um, however, I really, I really like what you're saying there because I really do want people to see these works as things that they could look really carefully at. And that over time, they could sort of start to dissect them and figure out like, oh, um, you know, this material here is the same as this material here. And this material here is actually from the same piece of material here. At least it looks like the texture is still the same. And you sort of start to piece together how the work was made and how, how it, came into the world. So I like that over time, you have this sort of opportunity to meditate on the work. And um, that's become more important to me as our time has become sort of taken from us. Uh, as we've become more and more distracted, like so hard to put that device down, even when I'm working in the studio. And so I've really sort of uh, leaned into the idea of making things that sort of require, not require more attention, but that if you give them more attention, they'll sort of give you more rewards. And that um, as they unfold in, over time, there'll be this sort of um, sense that you're like, as an audience, you're engaged and you're growing with the work, you're finding new things. I think of art as like something that's not dead in a museum, but something that's really changing and unfolding over time. And the way we think about art and the way we look at art and what we discover about art um, continues to sort of unfold and change us also as an audience. Maybe I'll um, give you a little, little tour now. How's that sound, Jillian? Yes, sounds great. Okay, so um, I'm in a studio in uh, Brooklyn, New York. My studio, uh, the building was built, I think at the beginning of the 20th century. It was originally an ammunitions factory. Um, so it has these really big high um, sort of vaulted ceilings, which are about 20 feet high. Um, and then it became a mousetrap factory so when I moved in, the first and second floor, uh, they were manufacturing mouse traps that smelled like peanut butter uh, because they were peanut butter scented mouse traps. So on uh, like once or twice a week, they would put the peanut butter smell in the mouse traps, which would make the whole building smell like really sickly. Uh, so when I got the space, I loved the high ceilings. I loved how the be how beautiful the light was here, but because it was still this mouse trap factory. I also got a really good deal and signed a quite long lease. So now it's, as with everything in New York, now this is a really hot neighborhood and um, I couldn't afford to be here anymore, but I have a little more time left on my studio lease. So, so I'm saying that just to give you a little background that I'm lucky to have a nice, a nice sort of sized studio. Um, so uh, I um, like to work with, uh, tables on wheels because I like to move around all the time how I'm working in the studio um, and sort of change the position of things. Um, I have these some sort of lofted spaces for storage and I um, have different tables where I'm working on my painting processes but let's say when you first come into my studio I'll take you you're coming in through the front door. Usually I like to direct you to one of the big 
bigger pieces that's on the wall and have you look at it for a lot while like we just did. And then we might start looking at some documentation. Um, so I have documentation of performance work, of uh, working with dancers in the studio, some of my live performances. So images from different performances over the years. Because even though I'm working with abstraction, I'm really interested in the relationship between abstraction and the body. Um, so the performances and the images of the performances are a nice reminder of that sort of undercurrent. Um, and you can see my, uh, some of my paint mixed up and somewhat ready to go. Documentation of some recent installations. And then I'm working with um, fabrics, which I'm altering and dyeing and applying different processes to. Some of the fabrics got marked and stained by working with dancers and their, the clothes that they were wearing or we were working with canvas on the floor. But then I also have tons and tons of like dyed um, t-shirt fabric. And I have, everywhere you look, I have, I'm a little bit like a, like a quilter, like lots of fabric scraps that I've altered and stained and painted. Um, on this wall, I have, for example, samples of different patterns that I'm working with and experimenting with. This is, um, these are sort of like more optical patterns I've been experimenting with. So this is all sewn. And one of the benefits of working on fabric like this is that I can, um, so for example, this is, if you can see this, this is t-shirt fabric. So it, it, I can work on it and then like soak it and um, spray it and spritz it and like scrunch it up. So it's very tactile as opposed to canvas on a stretcher, which is less tactile. Um, then over here are some experiments I'm doing. I've been working with uh, scraps to make these sort of uh, net-like sculptures. Um, I'm not sure exactly where these are going yet, but I'm playing around with them. Um, this is a sort of template for a sort of spider web type of net using things like um, uh, waistbands, zippers, things like that. Um, this is a, a, an entire shirt that I've been staining and playing with what types of patterns and marks I can get into it. So this is sort of like the first steps before I start cutting things into pieces. So for example, this is a piece of a shirt that's been altered and painted and I'm getting some really beautiful marks there. And then the next step would be, give me a second. You can see here, I have these different patterns that I'm working with. And so I would take a piece of fabric like this, and I start tracing out, and I've done lots of tests with the pattern already, but I start tracing out these pieces, then cutting them. And then if they have to get backed with fabric, um, so here's a pile that's already been backed with linen. So you can see the front and then totally different on the back. And so that's been sort of um, archivally glued between front and back. This is dyed linen. Um, Jonathan, what is the archival glue yeah. that you use to connect, to put in the, attach, attach the linen? Like, is it an interface? It's called, B, it's, it's called Biva. You uh -huh. have to use, you have to heat it with an iron. It's super complicated. It's what, um, conservators used to back old paintings mm -hmm. uh, when they're trying to preserve them. Got it. Yeah, so it comes in big sheets. Okay. Um, 
And then I'll show you, so let's say I have all these pieces. The next thing I would do is I'd start laying them out on the ground. So looking at them, then I'm gonna sort of start thinking about, do I have the right colors, et cetera. And then eventually I get to like this point. So this is a painting that's more or less laid out and um, I'm in the sewing process. And I have over there an industrial sewing machine and I start sewing them. So in that way, I'm, I am working like a, a, a quilter might work. And I'll just show you what one of these strips looks like. So here's, here's this sort of set of strips that have been put together. Um, and then it's ready for the next step, which is to sew those long seams together. I don't always work this way, but this is a way I've been working for, one of the primary ways I've been working for nine or nine or 10 years. Um, let me show you. So one question, do you cut them sure. and then you glue the back part mm. for each piece individually? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's a. I think it works really well, but time-wise, it's it's complicated. So, like this, so I'll show you. So this big painting here. This is from 2017. Took about six or seven months to make. And this was made with t-shirt fabric. You can even see some of the t-shirts have like decals and um, text on them. And I've been working, I was working a lot with this net pattern, pressing paint soaked nets into the t-shirt. And here you can see bits of old t-shirts. Often they're t-shirts that were mine or a family members or partner. So that process is, is pretty complicated uh, and takes some time. Um, I also, um, earlier, these on my website, but these actively drip paint when they're uh, in public view. This one is woven. This is like a woven cord, woven by hand. And then you can see the paint which is built up. So they're actively dripping paint onto the floor when they're on public view. And uh, continuing to make those, but not quite as many as the paintings. So when you wash your nose in a... Oh, sorry, Marley. <laughs> no, go ahead, Tiff. <laughs> oh, when you make the drip paintings and you have them displayed in the space, do you continually add paint during the duration mm -hmm. of the exhibition? Okay, so you're like... Yeah, different color each day that they're on view. So by the end of the exhibition, the floors are quite stained with these puddles of paint. Um, and it's sort of like... A, rubbery paint that you can peel up off the floor when the exhibition is over. Um, so you have this sort of weird puddle, but the, they don't travel with their puddles. Their puddles stay behind. Are you using like acrylic house paint? Or no, I uh, honestly, I'm, I'm using all different things and I experimented for about three years trying to find the right uh, formula. That's my studio mate walking by. Um, I uh, took me a long time to get it viscous enough. So I'm still experimenting with different things. It really depends also like on the humidity and the temperature to get it to drip, you know, for six or seven hours. Thanks. But it's water-based. It's, I, you know, I don't want to use anything that would be toxic. What is the, well, let me ask you this. Um, what's the piece that you made that you love the most and how long did it take for you to make? Mm. I don't know if I have one that I love the most. 
Um, how would you define that? If you were looking at your own work, how would you define what you love the most? Would it be intuitive or would you have criteria you would follow? Like, well, there are always the piece that I make them. Every time I pass by, I'm like, oh, that's just, that's just so good. It's so satisfying to look at. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one that you want to frame and put every corner of your house. You know, it's just something that is... Mm the quality of the work maybe it's what i'm looking at uh, i mean although i mean obviously you cannot compare my work to your work <laughs> i mean you, all, all the pieces that you made they're amazing but um that oh, one you. that you're like oh wow like this is on spot huh well i'm pretty i'm a pretty tough customer um so i would say What's in, and also, you know, because I do these performances with sustained observation where I'm looking, you know, I stared at a Jackson Pollock painting for 40 hours. Um, I did a performance with a group of quilts st staring at 16 quilts for three hours each. Um, you know, things really change over time as you look at them. And I've had works come back from, you know, the, the art market works can work very fast. Uh, and if you're really hustling and trying to be in lots of shows and make money off of your work, you know, I've had things picked up for art fairs that um, were sent to some other place in the world. And I only saw them for a few hours finished. And I didn't like working that way anymore because sometimes those things would come back to my studio and I actually would think like, oh, I didn't have enough time to digest and sit with that. Um, not that working really fast and furious and intuitively is not like amazing and great, great work happens that way. But I found that for me, there was a certain period where I was just like producing too much and I thought that I really loved a piece, then it would come back and I'd look at it some more and I'd think like, oh, that's not, that's not quite where I want it to be. But I'm really tough on myself. So maybe not everyone would feel as self-conscious as I would. Um, I've also had things that I didn't love that um, I liked more over time. Maybe I didn't love them because they just felt like they were really pushing me out of my comfort zone. But I think one thing that's really important is to um, see how things stick with other people. And I've made work that I wasn't sure about that just affected audiences on all different ways. So um, someone who had no art background and no art training was like, I don't know what it is about this piece, but I'm really drawn to it. I'm really, I can't stop looking at it. Someone who had a lot of art background could come in and say like, oh, I see this reference to this history of painting and I see this reference to the body. And someone else could come in and say, oh, I'm really connecting to your work in terms of like, um, you know, uh, sexuality and the body and sensuality. Like when I hear that all these different reads are happening, that makes me feel like, oh, that work is actually doing something that even I can't see. And I need to pay attention to what other people are saying. So oftentimes that question about like what I like the most is often informed by what other people are saying. I would also say that the, some of the performances I've done are the most, have been the most important and sort of seminal parts of my own practice. And they're ephemeral, like they disappear. They don't exist anymore. There's just some documents of them. But um, uh, talking about them is still really generates a lot of interesting conversation and ideas. And they really change the way I thought about art and about audience and, and about myself. So like that performance looking at quilts was a really, just a tremendous like learning experience and um, it wasn't just me in the studio. It was like me with the whole museum, um, with the volunteers, with student volunteers, with, um, older adults who came to volunteer for the exhibition and like handle the quilts with me and people who came to tell me stories about quilt making in their own families. That was like a big thing. And so that, that sort of, I don't know if it was my favorite thing I ever did, but it, it sort of meant a lot to me. That was a long answer to your question, but thanks for a great, great question. No, thank you. So with that example that you just gave in mind about the performance looking at the quilts, I've been really struck this this whole time about the way that you speak about your work and you talk about 
pulling from the language of quilting and using quilting techniques, but you call the mm. finished pieces paintings. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that choice in the language, or maybe if there's a point when it stops being a quilt and starts becoming something else. Mm. That's a really good question. You know, I, I grew up in, in rural Pennsylvania near the Amish community. So I was around a lot of sewing and quilting. My father was, my father was an art teacher um, in the public schools for the early part of my life. And he was super experimental. He came out of this like late sixties attitude about like making art out of anything. Um, so, uh, you know, my brother and I had to learn how to sew and, and crochet and make latch hook. And we made felt together from um, wool collected from farm, farm animals. <laughs> so like we did really great, weird interdisciplinary stuff. So like, it's interesting to me that I sort of insist on calling them painting, but all of my younger years were about like, you can make art out of anything and you can call it whatever you want. Right. So like that was my tradie. My father grew up on a farm. My my grandmother was super into sewing. I learned to sew. Um, my mom, you know, it, it was a sort of very also very um, uh, gender roles in the household weren't super scripted. It wasn't like, you know, women sew and men don't. Um, so, you know, th that that sort of approach to making was very open. And of course, quilting is, has been historically been uh, mostly practiced by people who identify as women. Um, so when I started working with painting in this way, I really came out of, I guess, historically, I really came out of thinking about painting, about how paint could be applied to materials and about body movement. Gestural abstraction was really interesting to me. When I started cutting them up and sewing them back together, I guess I wanted to be really sensitive not to call them quilts because um, when I would meet quilters, we could have a really good conversation about the work, but I also didn't want to take that language away from the community that historically practiced it. So I'm sort of like, I feel my own questions about using term like that terminology. And I've talked to master quilters um, at length, including when I, when I did that performance with the quilts about how I as a as a white cis man would approach work made predominantly by women not necessarily anymore but um what does it mean for me to bring my body into the museum and to like look at these objects with reverence but still is it like my white male gaze that makes them proper objects. I didn't want that reading at all. I wanted to be really careful about that. And my friends from the quilt making community said, you know, we've been at this for a long time. It's really hard for us to sort of kick the glass ceiling down of the art world because our work isn't considered art in the same way. So I want to sort of be careful about giving the community of quilters their own due and not saying like, oh, I'm a quilter now. Um, but also sort of pay homage to it and also talk about how much I love that history and how deeply I care about it and how sort of magical and wonderful I think those objects are. I think, I think great 19th century quilts are art. Like, I don't, I don't like to call them craft. I think even if people slept under them, that makes them even more like an artwork to me. So I'm not giving you really a straight answer, but that's because I sort of flip back and forth myself in terms of how I would answer these questions. And then the last thing is just a technical one, which is tip like a quilt capital Q would be a quilt top. Mine, mine are just the quilt tops essentially, which is pieced and then sewn to a backing and then there would be padding in between and then they would be, you know, used to functionally used. Yeah, thank you for that. It is, it's really complicated. And so it's nice to hear you sort of like be honest and open about all the different ways that you think about it um yeah so there, there's yeah I'm, I'm with you like there's no right or singular answer to that question um so thank you yeah for being so forthcoming about that sure 
I mean, uh, uh, honestly, also, I've had people sort of poo-poo my work as paintings because they're like, oh, it's sewn, it's made from clothes, like it's not real painting. You know, I've, there's so many biases that go into even the way we think about what materials are appropriate for art and what materials are quote unquote not appropriate. And that's really driven by the marketplace, which gives, you know, a, the best 19th century quilt in the world might sell for maybe $100,000, um, you know, at a big auction. But, you know, um, a big de Kooning painting, which is, you know, from the 1970s, could sell for $100 million. So that's that's also really meaningful, the way that, you know, the market generates meaning. So we have to sort of think through that also. Yeah, I, I had a similar question along that line, and I think you kind of answered my question because I was thinking, like, how does your work like address um, the history of privilege and class behind crafting, or if you even like uh, uh, address that type of thing or thought about your work in that way? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I certainly like when I went to so the piece that I did with the quilts was at this museum called the Columbus Museum in Georgia. They uh, commissioned me to do a sustained observation performance with something in their collection. So I could have picked anything from their collection. What was really interesting about working with their collection. Um, and they, they literally gave me a whole week like by myself in their vault with like thousands of objects, which was amazing. I had to learn how to handle things, of course, but um, what was really interesting about that was that they were founded as a museum of art and local history in the same building. So they only collected quilts on the local history side of the collection they didn't collect them on the art side of the collection. Um, the history of collecting, of course, is, uh, is a mirror to all the social stratification that we face, right? So it's not that there weren't artists of color making incredible objects, but that museums and institutions were also, you know, uh, steeped in systemic racism and didn't consider those objects art um, per se. However, their quilt collection, which was collected as local history, included examples of work made by um, across racial uh, and class lines also. So quilts made by, you could see quilts made by sumptuous, like with sumptuous, beautiful silks, which was super expensive. And like 60 varieties of silk in one quilt and every stitch perfectly put together. And I looked at quilts with, that had 10,000 pieces of, in them. That's a, that is a symbol of class and privilege, right? No one's gonna be able to make a quilt. No one's gonna have the time to make a quilt with 10,000 pieces if they need to get warm and they're poor. But that quilt was still beautiful. But next to it, because again, the category was quote unquote local history, or, um, quilts made by women of color in the 1880s that were incredible objects made from, that had a different quality because they were clearly made from whatever material was available to them. And you could see that by studying them for hours at a time. So my argument to the museum was, okay, this is amazing that you have both of these, you have in your collection, which now they're trying to sort of figure out, okay, is it art or is it local history? You have these things which I think of as, let's like put them in the place of works of art. Let's just call them art. They came into the collection as quote unquote craft, as quote unquote local history, but let's put them up. So I, I asked the museum to hang them in the central rotunda of the museum, which is like the sort of key space you see when you first walk in. And they're big, they're the size of big American abstract paintings. Let's hang them right there in the middle so that you see them right when you walk in and let's just call them art and hang them in the place where we would put art and give them that prominence and then let people decide what these objects are. And I think the museum really, they wanted to engage with that conversation. They wanted to think about that. Um, and they, 
they also just hadn't really looked at these objects. <laughs> like they, you know, many museums are understaffed. Their curators aren't paid well. They didn't have time to spend three days looking through um, all of this material. And so it really, they also, um, you know, started thinking about putting things like quilts in next to paintings. The Museum of Modern Art still doesn't um, own any functional quilts. They own like quilts made as art, but as far as I know, they don't own any that were made as functional objects. They still don't consider that like modern art. But if you look at a 19th century quilt, it's as modern as it gets. So um, anyway, part of the, the long answer to your question, but part of what I was trying to do with a performance like that is ask the institution really um, complicated questions about what their collection means and how they're working with it. And most institutions want to ask that question too. But anytime any of you go to a museum and look at the collection, don't think of that as like a dead thing with just stuff sitting on a wall. Think of it as this living, breathing thing that someone made a decision to buy, that someone took care of, that someone stored and handled carefully so that it, we could still look at it. And then someone else had to, has to come in and say, is this still the best example of this? Or why don't we put this abstract painting next to a great quilt from the 19th century? Like, let's really think about what belongs here and what doesn't. And that's why I think museums are fascinating places to interrogate as an artist. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, and I'm, I hope this makes sense. I was trying to figure out how to word this question, <laughs> but um, I guess I'm just curious if you've ever been surprised by how your work was written or talked about in a way mm. that you hadn't yet considered or done with intention. Hmm. Sometimes, yes. I mean, I think the writing of about my work that sticks with me is, is like writers who actually I got to meet and they, you know, ask me questions. Um, I think good, good writers also, you know, it's part of like the whole thing, it's part of your whole job of being an artist is to like, also think about how you want your work to be talked about. And believe it or not, most of the shows I've had at galleries in New York, or especially early on in my career, that there's the press release that describes the work, they asked me to write it. <laughs> so like, then the writers come in, the press comes in, this has changed a lot because now everything's online. And, um, you know, this is like pre social media that I'm thinking, thinking about, or pre like, Instagram, especially, as the main sort of art world currency. Um, it was a little more formal, magazines, print media. media. Uh, the writers come in and write about it, but they're actually using some of the words that I wrote about my own work, but it's supposed to be like an anonymous press release. So it's actually funny, I think, how much leverage we can have over how people talk about our work. Um, I would say that um, because I've been in a lot of shows that are focused on um queer life and queer politics often the work is written about through that lens and um often i'm really happy about that and i'm glad about that and then other times i'm like oh i i wish it could also someone could address these other things too so uh, i think sometimes i have i think with with any of us if our work is written about in terms of identity like there's parts of that I, that I think we can forefront and say, yes, that's what I want you to say it, talk about with my work. That is important, I want you to see that. But then I think there's also moments where you're like, okay, but there's also these other things I wanna talk about too. Like, how do we even do that as, how do we even walk that line as artists? Yeah, I'm sure you get that in studio critiques also. Like, there's what you wanna talk about and then there's what people see. So I would say, and then my final thought on that would be, I think when the work that I'm making is working at its best, I start to see that the intentions that I have are lining up with people's reactions. So like when I was in grad school, this is what I, these, this was my intentions for my work. This is what I thought it was about. And this, this was people's reactions. And I was like, 
I was like, oh, I don't think that's what the work is about. I think it's about this. And they would be like, I don't see that at all. I think it's about this. And then as I got towards the end of school and kept working and working and sort of figuring out what my work was about, towards the end, people were like, I think the work is about this. And I was like, oh yeah, I see that. That makes a lot of sense. Like my intentions and people's reactions started to line up. So the writing that I get the most excited about is even, it might not even be my own idea that I would articulate, but at least it sounds like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. That's, that is something that I sort of, someone's uncovering something that I would hope for in the work. Do you have a couch to rest in your studio? <laughs> uh, I do now. My, my boyfriend complained for years because he would be like, I don't want to come to your studio. There's no place to like sit. Like, what, have I, what do you just want me to stand around in your cold studio? Um, so I have, I have like a little office behind that door there with a little, little old couch in it. I was wondering all oh, that, like everything seemed like a spot that I was like, where is the couch? Because uh, one of my teachers told me like, you need a couch so you can see the, so you can see the stuff that you're making. And I was like, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, when I first did the, um, started performing these sustained observation performances of looking at artworks for a long period of time, when I looked at the Jackson Pollock painting for 40 hours, it was five, eight hour, five, eight hour days. And I wanted to stand. It was important to me to be standing the whole time. So I actually trained to stand for eight hours at a time. I worked with a dancer trained in something called Alexander technique, which is a sort of body awareness technique. Um, and because of that, uh, that's when I made my table so high because I, I wanted to be also standing while I was working. It took me about six months to be really clear that I could stand for eight hours, like very comfortably. So I started working on standing tables. And um, that's the reason I guess I don't have, ton I didn't for a long time have tons of seating areas because I really liked, when I start, when I had to do that, I ended up really liking working standing. I liked how it made me more like attentive and present to my work. Um, I don't have against anything against sitting on a couch in your studio, to be clear. But for me, that was a sort of byproduct of a performance and it really changed the way I worked with my own body. And because I've worked so often with dancers coming into the studio, they are like, you know, well-trained dancers are just a wealth of information about move your body around the space. And that was really revelatory to me, like just the way they would, move in the studio and move with materials and just the facility they had with with understanding their own body and also talking to me and being like why are you standing that way you need to adjust your shoulders and like you know oh you're so oh your your back is sore they'd have like 50 solutions for me to figure out how to make my back less sore so i love bringing people into the studio who are from different disciplines than me I have a you question. About, uh, oh. oh, good. I have a question about the performances where you stand for a really long time. Like uh, in the night of the longest day, I think you stood like almost eight hours. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, do you see these like a form of med meditation for yourself? Yeah, good question. I, you know, when I did the Pollock performance, uh, in 2011, I trained physically for it, but I didn't really train mentally for it. And I really felt mentally like um, I wasn't fully prepared. It was quite a hard thing to do mentally because when I started that performance, I only, uh, the rule I often keep is I keep my field of vision the same for the whole time. So literally I don't, I never turned my head to the side. I always had the painting in view. So after that, I started doing more meditation work. And when I did the quilt performance, I did some uh, meditation training and um, worked with a few folks who, uh, friends of mine who had studied and led meditation to learn some techniques so that I could do that. Um, 
the night of the longest day I was staring at my parents' house from dusk until dawn. That was a little hard because um, I knew, I mean, part of the point was like to put the camera in the point of view of the parent. And uh, I was at my mom's house. My father had, had passed away earlier that year. And I knew my mom would be like anxious about me standing outside all night. <laughs> so she kept coming to the window like every couple hours. Um, so it was hard to, that was a hard one to meditate because it was like, you know, meditation at its best is like learning to be um, present and quiet your mind through distraction. And that one really tested me. So uh, maybe I need to do it again. I got another question for you. Uh, so knowing that Colting has a long history in, uh, you know, in humans' life, um, is there a region or like a specific country that you're like really admire their work about their quilting? About quilting? Yeah, about their quilting, like in a specific culture mm. or a region that you love the most. Well, quilting is an especially American, U.S. American phenomenon. There are some pre precedents for it in Northern Europe and England, but it was really um, in the U.S. Uh, as the country was expanding that um, women were making quilts out of scraps of fabric out of necessity. Uh, so to me, those are, those are super interesting. Um, but in terms of like global and world art, <laughs> um, I will say more recently, there's some really interesting work that incorporates this idea of piecing, um, materials together. So, um, let me think of some good examples. Uh, the, uh, I think he's Ghanaian, the artist Ibrahim Mahama, M-A-H-A-M-A, -A -A, um, who's a fairly young contemporary artist, makes these giant pieces. He covers entire buildings with jute sacks. So like the sort of burlap sacks that are used to, in the global commodities trade, to like move coffee beans and um, other goods around, cuts them up after they've been used sometimes dyes them and then works with big communities of people to sew them together and make these sort of um, tapestries. Um, there's, uh, and I remember, forget his name. There's an Ethiopian artist who makes um, work out of discarded circuit boards, like computer circuit boards, but he pieces them together almost like quilts. Um, I think his name is Sidime, um, is his last name. And also this younger artist who has a big piece at this exhibition in LA called Desert X, named Serge, Sergei Cloty, C-L-O-T-T-E-Y. I think he's also Ghanaian, but I could be wrong. He makes pieced sort of almost like tapestries out of yellow, um, bottles that are used to transport goods around in different regions of Africa. And he sort of, he made like a whole room out of them. And so to me, they're actually doing what um, quilters are doing, like making big um, surfaces, coverings out of small sort of discarded materials pieced together. Tiffany, did you have another question? Yeah, uh, when you were talking about performance art and having um, dancers, I was just curious if you ever include like musicians or that sort of thing within your performance work or do you usually just keep it like, I don't know, like within the, the traditional 
academic art world or do you like branch out more towards like street performance or that sort of thing uh, or musical mm, performance or yeah i haven't worked a ton with music i i do teach visual art for performers so i work with, a lot with students who have musical training um and so sometimes they'll compose like sound compositions with their voices while we're working in the classroom or in the studio together um and there's also i guess how do i answer that because i work with abstraction so much anything with vocalization or lyrics i find harder to connect to my work because it adds a particular type of meaning that like i think of a i think of abstraction as um almost like pre-verbal. Like I'm interested in abstraction because I'm interested in things that you can't find the words for. Impulses, feelings, traumas, things you can't sort of put words to. To me, abstraction is a way to sort of convey that without telling a story, quote unquote. So when I work with musicians, if I work with musicians, it would be more to create a sort of sonic or sound landscape. Um, I haven't worked with street performance so much, but I do have this ongoing performance called self-portrait as my mother in which which i've done i think like six times now in which i hire typically an actress but i've worked with non-actors also to show up at my opening with a carrying a purse which is dripping paint onto the floor of the gallery and so i did the last one of those i did was um in memphis and uh, worked with um, a woman who sort of wandered around the block around the gallery with this sort of paint dripping out of her purse for three hours. So I do like inserting things within, to, like, within the sort of life of the town or the community. Cool, thank you. <laughs> sure. I have a question might be a little I don't know it's basic but um I have like a love-hate relationship with the sketchbook and I'm just wondering like does a, a sketchbook have any role in your work like do you jot any notes down or like plan at all or your sketches kind of your experimentations with like the the waistbands and the netting and things like that mm. yeah that's a that's a really good question it's um I think sculptors often have a different relationship to sketching and drawing than than painters might um i would say uh yes i sketch a lot um i keep lots of let me see if i have anything nearby hold on I think of, you know, because my work is so process oriented and it takes a long time to develop the pattern and then the put the piece together and then I sometimes I'm pulling a piece apart and then redoing it. There's like lots of like active like sketching as I'm going. So I'm like playing around with different patterns. Um, and then I'm also like I'm playing around with there's like material sketching. So I'm like playing around like this is just sort of like a staining process on a piece of paper and i'm trying to figure out if that could like um be applied to uh materials other sorts of materials uh like that shirt that i held up earlier in the class that to me is almost like a sketch like i'm trying to figure out how to do something with that material maybe i'll get something maybe i won't I guess the difference for me with like if i'm like sketching on materials is i might actually get something that i end out wanting to use that will go into the final piece. Um, I also do, like, to me, what we think of as sketching, which is really just like thinking through process, also involves a lot of research. So I, not only museums, but I, I love going to look at stuff and I've gone to archives of, um, that included like uh, um, like uh, women would make pattern books in the late 19th century where they would like 
learn how to sketch basically with thread. So I've like gone to look at those at archives. There's also like um, uh, samplers, if you know what an embroidery sampler is, like young women had to learn how to like do all different types of stitches to mend fabric. Um, these date back to like, you know, hundreds of years old. I love looking at those because those are sort of like sketches and thread. Um, so I think, I think you, you know, any, any student, I would encourage you to think about sketching like very broadly. And of course, also now with smartphones, um, taking pictures of stuff, not only in your own studio as you're working on it. And then like, I like to take a picture before I leave the studio. So my studio is not in my house. And then like, before I go to bed, I'll just pull the picture up and try to just look at it non judgmentally and see what I see from what I'm working on. That's also sort of like part of the sketching process for me. But the, you know, if you like using, um, drawing apps on your phone you can sketch over things you can circle them you can also use photo editing stuff on a phone to like flip the image upside down or like cut part of it off or erase part of it so i think like think about sketching really openly the hard part then is keeping track of where your good sketches are like oh, are they on my phone or in this pile or are they over here yeah yeah thank you yeah i've definitely lost a sketchbook or two yeah I hear you. What What do you have going on right now? Um, the pandemic. <laughs> um, you know, I think like all of us, I'm trying to figure out um, whether or not this period of time will change my work i don't know for me i work i work very slowly and i sort of absorb information very slowly so i think it's too soon to tell um i had a, some shows canceled because of the pandemic so and then some things pushed back so i'm working on a show uh in new york for a year from now um i've been working on some writing uh and some um sort of like for back of lack of a better term like almost like performance lectures so i was asked to give a sort of performance lecture on the idea of waiting um and so these become these like they were all done over zoom so it's like a lecture with um images and uh me reading and i showed like images from my own life in relationship to um historic painting um so that's been that's become anyway i could talk about that some more maybe else what else could i say about that um yeah that that invitation was to talk about this concept of waiting and so i had this idea to talk about what it means to um wait for someone who's ill or who's healing or who's chronically ill so um for that performance lecture, I started thinking about um, Renaissance painting of figures that were wounded and like bloody and bleeding. And there's all this like history of religious painting. If you go to the old religious painting section, Western painting of a museum, I noticed that there were all these bodies that were like suffering very deeply. And I had a chronically ill parent who was ill and hospitalized on and off for many decades and so as i looked at those paintings they weren't so much for me about like religious life um or like quoting a passage from the bible they were about just like human suffering and depictions of wounded of wounded people and i found that really interesting because in contemporary art i didn't really see that anywhere but I saw it in my own life because of having a family member who was chronically, critically ill and spent a lot of time in hospitals. So I was sort of trying to figure out like how to thread this needle between like me working in abstraction, non-figure, you know, I don't make depictions of things, but loving these old paintings, which really communicated something about suffering and about illness, which is something we've all been surrounded by for the last year. Um, 
and just like trying to understand how I could look at these old works as a way to talk about something that had happened to me and what its relationship was to my work. So that that was a really uh, that became really interesting. And you know, being asked to do that and trying to speak more personally and openly about my work and um, talk about my relationship to sort of old art that I really liked um, looking at. And I don't know, that might become a video or that might become, you know, some other, um, take up some other sort of space in my studio. So I have the things that I'm working on and I'm still working on. And then I have this other stuff that's sort of like new things that are floating around and I'm trying to decide how to incorporate them. And then when you said you're writing, what, what happens with your writings? Do they go to a magazine? Do they stay as part of your process? I started writing more, um, let's see, for that show. Uh, well, after the Pollock performance, I was asked to write some things about that because the performance was sort of unusual. And I liked, I, I'm a very slow writer. I find it really hard, but I liked that. I liked doing it. I liked what I was able to say. Um, and then, so for the, I think uh, maybe I sent Jillian the, the text that I wrote for the quilt performance. Um, I, that, in that case, the museum asked me if I would write something about the performance and that turned into a, a much bigger, longer text than I imagine it would be. Um, and then I just sort of started incorporating it into my practice a little bit more and yeah, I'll send it to, I'll send like a text to someone I know who works with a website or a magazine, you know, the thing, the thing with the change in print media that we have so much like this just online and that's not printed anymore. It also sort of opened the playing field so that lots of people, you know, can, can write and submit it or start your own, you know, start your own site with some friends, like think about writing differently, um, opening, you know, what's published up to a more diverse group of writers. Uh, all of that I think is really important. So, um, I'm also, sometimes I'll have a friend ask me to do an interview. I like that process too, of doing an interview. Um, and then recently, um, I have a, f I have a friend who was, uh, a, who was in one of my performances about 10 years ago. He performed in it. He's an artist that I really admire. And he also, like me, works in abstraction. He's also queer, also dealing with issues about the body. And he, um, he was a refugee to Canada from Guatemala. Uh, so his family fled what I think was the, I might be getting this wrong, but I think it was the Guatemalan Civil War um, to Canada. So we started this dialogue about what it means to sort of engage with abstraction and whether there are political ramifications to making work which is ab abstract. And that had been a question that I'd really been thinking a lot about in my own studio and that curators had been asking me like, what, where's the politics in this work? It's, you know, that sort of question. And I, I was sort of like really pondering that and um, wanted to engage with another artist who was thinking about it. So that was an example of like writing where we just started talking and saying, oh, let's actually write this out as a conversation. Um, and now we've created this dialogue, which we're printing and um, also trying to do an exhibition of our work together that also includes the text. I think the pandemic was just an interesting place to like to write because we didn't really have the same. Like the way we communicate had to change. So for me, writing sort of became writing, making these lectures became a sort of different part of my practice during the pandemic. There's a question. Um, it might be kind of boring, but um, I always get really. I like boring questions. Learning, <laughs> <laughs> I always get really interested in learning more about um, people's uh, or other artists' um, color palette choices. Mm. So I guess, um, do you? I know me. I usually come up with a color palette before I come up with a composition and kind of match them together. What's your order mm. of of doing that? Do you have any? Thing that you use typically for inspiration for color palettes? Mm. You know, um, I did another, 
lecture to a class recently and someone asked me the same question and I was like a little stumped. I didn't have a good answer. And so afterwards I like came up with the perfect answer after class was over, but now I can't remember what it was. Um, but I, um, I think about color pretty intuitively. Um, I do come up with different color palettes for different pieces. So like that piece that's behind my shoulder there, I really wanted a strong contrast between that edge, which is also a different pattern, and the inner um, palette, which is black, white, and blue. The reason I chose that actually was it that black, white, and blue, they're like plus signs. The reference was a, um, like a Byzantine icon painting, and it was a saint's robe that was painted those colors. So I like this idea that it was like something someone was wearing. Um, and apparently that plus pattern stood for equality and justice. Um, so I sort of pulled that color palette and the pattern from this historic painting. And then I wanted a strong contrast by adding that orange edge. Um, and a piece like, like this one, I kept trying to make that brighter. And there's even like, if you look carefully, there's like a little bit of like bright red in there at the very edge. There's some orange up here. I kept trying to add in other colors, but like, and because I'm laying them out on the floor, I can really add stuff in and then take it away. Um, so my process is very like accumulating, adding, taking it away. But I just couldn't, it just didn't work. I couldn't get the mood of that piece right when I started adding brighter colors in the center. Uh, and I don't know if that was just intuitive or I don't know if that was the sort of like being so deep in the pandemic and feeling this like grays and purples and blues. I don't, I don't know that, you know, there's also this debate like where we could say like, just because you're using bright colors doesn't mean you're happy right? Or just because you're using like gloomy colors doesn't mean you're sad. I've made really brightly colored paintings when things were really tough in my life. So um, I don't, so yeah, I see I still don't have a great answer to this question. I think about it a lot. I do research into it, but I, in terms of the why, I would say that's, that's a part of my practice that is much more intuitive. Now that we're talking about color and all that, uh, do you cut each piece and color them individually or you color like a whole piece of fabric and then you cut it? How does that process work? Oh, always the whole piece of fabric. And then I have big swaths of fabric. Basically the way this started is like, I was never, I was never good at like painting like this with like a brush. Like I wasn't super interested in my own hand like the type of mark that I would make but when I'm like pouring color over like a big piece of denim and watching the way the paint moves over like a pocket or a seam the piece is like this big but then I get like a part that I like that's like this big so I'm like for me that process is really important because it's really it's open there's big pieces of material and a lot of paint and a lot of colors but I don't have to like, um, I don't have to take what I make and just use it as is. There's yet another layer of choosing that I can do where I can say, this is really interesting to me, but this part isn't. And so that process is really open for me because it lets me work um, in big areas and big pieces and big washes of color without having to commit to the whole thing being just right. Does that make sense? I can just cut out the piece part that I like and use that. And then maybe what's um, left behind will, will be really interesting at some other point. Well, that's so much fun, I would believe. <laughs> You're not obligated <laughs> to use a specific part. You're like, okay, this is it, what I want. Well, that's, that's interesting, yes. thank you. Yeah, because my like um, sort of intuitive mind, like I set up the structure, so it's like, denim and this type of pain and this type of pore, my intuitive mind can just sort of try all sorts of different things within that. But then my sort of like more logical mind 
that's like really analyzing and conceptualizing what I want out of the work, then it can take over and say like this part next to this part, this t-shirt fabric next to this fabric. Yeah. Thank you. For one more question, if that's okay, Jonathan, right now we're at. Sure. Okay. No pressure, it doesn't have to be the best question of, of the, just a question, if anyone has another one. Uh, I guess I can give another question. <laughs> I have so many questions sure. today. Um, I just wanna comment, I really like how you described just now about how you like make these paintings and like you only take pick and choose what you like and like recreate mm. that's i like that um but my question i'm gonna kind of jump back to you were talking about your writing and your writing like how you write um when i was looking at your website i noticed that you write a lot about like in your studio which mm. when you look at artists websites it's usually just like specifically about the piece not while it's in process it's like what it mm. that full stuff but I, I don't know like i really like how you approach that and i was wondering if you could like expand on like i don't know maybe why you're drawn to write that way or if that's like mm. considered your artist statement um mm. Yeah, maybe if you could just like expand on that. <laughs> mm. Well, a lot of, you know, a lot of people came, when I first started working with dancers uh, in the studio, that would just be a few of us working together and no one would see that except in the documentation, right? So people would come to me and say like, well, but we don't really get to see all that a really interesting process that happens. Um, and if you think about the history of abstract painting, particularly in the US, I'm really interested in this topic of how we think about how things are made. So Pollock, Jackson Pollock is documented by Hans Namath, this photographer and filmmaker, making his work in his studio. And uh, images of Pollock working were published in Life magazine in the 1950s. And Pollock apparently felt very uncomfortable with that after it happened and he had been sober and then he started drinking again and he sort of declined. The story being that they think that he felt uncomfortable exposing his process to the world. However, seeing an artist's process as being inherently significant to the work that they make. And I think when we look at like a Pollock painting, for example, uh, we can see how it's made, right? Like that's part of the pleasure of looking at that work is seeing how it's made. That really changed in many ways the way people thought about how to make art, how to talk about art, and had a had a global impact too. So like the Gutai group in Japan, who was super interesting collective of artists, loose collective of artists, also started doing public exhibitions and live happenings. And then Alan Capro and Carolee Schneemann and um, Trisha Brown and lots of other super interesting artists in the US started doing these sort of live works in which you would see the work being made in addition to the sort of final object. So I'm really interested in that history, how I connect to that history. And um, Pollock is sometimes called the first performance artist. Uh, because not only because his work, his process was shown to the audience, but because he also was using the whole studio and also like found materials as the material for the work to be made, throwing cigarette butts onto the surface of the painting. I don't want to glamorize Pollock too much. Like I think he's also, you know, that mythology also needs to be debunked and the machismo is, you know, something I've, I wanted to, you know, critique in a way by by sort of putting my own body in front of that painting for 40 hours um however i do think this history is really interesting and uh i want to connect to that history and figure out how to use language to talk to people about my process um 
and there's there's also tons of other you know amazing artists who who you should look at if you're interested in that type of work sam gilliam linda Bangless, um lots of other folks that come through that history the, the other thing i'll say about that is i got a little frustrated with um, press releases for shows which were so theoretical and like so um, opaque that like I was like is this work really about the history of Lacanian psycho um, psychoanalysis like poetically that's really interesting but I'd also sort of like to know just like what the material of the work is and what it's about and so I got really interested in just speaking more directly about my work as opposed to just speaking about it theoretically. That's awesome, thank you. <laughs> sure. I'm gonna put those um, in the chat here. I'll put those, I remember those artists that I talked about earlier who are working with Piecine. Um, those are all artists from Africa, contemporary artists from Africa and uh, also, the the Gutai group, if you don't know it, from Japan, really cool, 1950s group of artists. Mm. Thank you so much, Jonathan. This was so um, just so generous and so helpful, um, showing us your sketchbook and moving around the studio. And then, I really also just want to say, I really appreciate the way that you. Um, wove together the different aspects of of being an artist that you're the you're the kind of artist that is from the level of sketching things to piecing together different types of materials um to talking about how you're actually like using the museum and its collections mm. and diving into that and becoming aware of of how different museums collect in different ways but then also even on the level of like a press release and how your own work is mm. being described and your own role in that description. And like, you're, you're such a wonderful model for this class and, and just for all of us of, of um, taking full ownership and full participation in, in your life as an artist. You're not just a person who's making things in a studio and then it just goes out there. You're really, actively engaged in and, and, and in a state of inquiry um, and creation mm. it's like with all of these different aspects. And it's, that to me is like the studio in terms of this class, like the studio in its broadest form, right? It goes beyond just the physical space that one works in. It's actually part of a practice of, of being as an artist. And, and I think mm. you've revealed or, or let us into how you do that so wonderfully. So thank you. Thank you, Jillian, that's really kind. Um, thank you all for your great questions and also for letting me ramble and think out loud a bit. That's a nice pleasure for me to, to have the time and space to do that with such, a, um, such an engaged group of students. So I really appreciate you all um, being here and asking such thoughtful questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, <laughs> ciao everybody. Take care, good luck Bye. with your studies. Thank and. You. and um, <laughs> Good luck getting Thank through uh, this this pandemic. Stay healthy, and I think we're very close to having classes in person again. Yes. So. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Thank you.